<laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Future in Space Hangout, a bi-weekly live discussion about all things related to humanity's future in space. My name is Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.Space, and today we have a panel of experts to discuss going to the moon, fr going from the moon to Mars. Because for decades, and certainly every time we talk about going to Mars here on these Hangouts, advocates of going to the moon have argued that going there will help us get to Mars. But will it really? Uh, recently, several dozen experts critically examined whether astronaut exploration of the moon could be used to feed forward to a human mission to the Martian surface by the end of the 2030s. And what they found, we're going to talk about here today, and it may surprise you. So today we're going to be talking with people who are thinking about going from the moon and finding out whether that helps us all that much in getting to Mars. But before I start, I want to mention that these Hangouts are sponsored by the American Astronautical Society, an organization dedicated to strengthening and growing the space community by increasing awareness of and support for space activities. I want to thank them so much for their support over the past two years, uh, because without them, we could not we could not be bringing these Hangouts to you. So I want to take a moment and thank you so much for that. These Hangouts are also endorsed by the American Astronomical Society, who support these Hangouts as a service to its members uh, and, and in their efforts to do STEM outreach. So thanks also to the American Astronomical Society. All right, we are back uh, for another Future in Space, and I have a special surprise. My co-host today, Alberto Conti from Ball Aerospace. Hi, yeah, Alberto. It's so good to have you back. Hey, Tony, it's finally I got back. I'm hoping I can do this on a regular basis now. So, I'll, But uh, today I'll pretend to be uh, Harley. Good. <laughs> no, 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 no. We, we, Harley stands on his own. He's, <laughs> but take a couple minutes, Alberto. I haven't seen you in years. So please, know, give, it, give us all just a couple minutes. Tell us what you've been so, doing. Where as you, you know, been? last time I joined, I can't remember where I was. But actually, I think I was still working at North You were. You were still at NG. Yeah, and so um, I had this opportunity to come here and uh, to had a new role as director of new business, so business development here at Ball Aerospace. So I moved for the third time in five years. <laughs> I moved to Boulder, actually. I moved to LA once and then back to DC, but I moved to Boulder in late September. So I've been in my office here now for about three months. Uh, I have an exciting team of folks who are doing incredible things in uh, earth science, planetary, heliophysics, and astrophysics. And so... Uh, I'm sure that we will talk about this if I keep joining these hangouts. So it's a uh, it's a privilege to see you again. It's uh, it's great. I miss this. I know it's it, we missed having you too because you are a real real source of uh, fun for these hangouts and and it's always uh, it's always good for me because um, you also help me start these we started together many back when remember when google first started doing hangouts we were on. young we had uh, our hair was black <laughs> yeah, i know right <laughs> all right well let me introduce our guest today i'm going to put up my little screen here you guys may notice first of all that i've got the chat uh, on the stream now uh, i am hopefully plugged into the uh youtube live chat which you should see on the screen i'm also got the discord server for deep astronomy uh on here as well as Twitch and um, Periscope, but Facebook probably not so much. But I am streaming on all those platforms, and I am able to get the chat together. So if you don't know where our Discord server is, please go down to the. There's a link to that in the description box of the stream, and it is um, it is there for all 24/7 chat fun. So go ahead and and, and join us there. So here we go. Um, okay, my guest today, we have three, only two of whom are visible. Uh, are visible to us today because one of them is in the ether. Steve Mitchell uh, from the University Space Research Source Association. Let me put him. Whoop, that's Clive. Uh, Steve Mac. Steve Mac Mitchell. Steve Macwell. Uh, <laughs> he's a planetary astronomer for USRA. How do you guys say that? Yes, all right. Is that good? USRA. Yeah. Just USRA. Uh, you don't try to say it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. And also joining me is. Uh, is uh, Clive Neal. He is a lunar scientist from Notre Dame. And in the ether, and when he talks, is Joe Cassidy. He is from Aerojet, Aerojet Rocket Dine. You out there, Joe? Yes. Yes. Say say something more. <laughs> say, I am happy to be here, That's Tony. Right. I'm here in the ether. I'm here in the ether. <laughs> I, I did send you, I think I was able to upload a picture, but you don't have to use yes, it. Yes, I am going to, while while I get somebody else talking, I get a moment to push some buttons. I will get it, I will get it up, and then when you're talking, I'll put it in. So thanks for sending us that. All right, very good. Okay, today we're talking about going to Mars, 
via the moon. Now, you guys apparently all met, some of you, lunar and Martian people. And what did you <laughs> tell? Who wants to tell us, first of all, about this discussion and summarize what you guys found? And then we're going to dive into some of the details. Who wants to yeah. do that? Steve and Clive, if it's okay, maybe I'll take that and then you guys can chime in. Um, the other affiliation I have is with Explore Mars. I'm on their board and we have run a series of workshops for a number of years now. I guess this was our sixth one called, uh, started out as the Affording Mars Workshops. And uh, this recently uh, we changed from affording to achieving because we thought we'd nailed the affordability aspects well enough. And as things have been evolving, one of the things I think that folks are familiar with is that, you know, we, we do believe there's a number of long poles that have to be addressed before we're ready to just uh, depart Earth orbit and get on that long trajectory of several months, you know, six to eight months out to Mars with people. And one of the re ways we've talked about doing that is going out deeper into space and using orbits and, and other uh, potential uh, you know, resources that are available to us uh, on the moon. And so that was the subject of this workshop called AM6. And we did invite Clive and Steve and a number of folks from the lunar community to come and join uh, the rest of us crazy Martians. And I think we had a, a very nice discussion. There were about 60 folks there, experts in a number of different areas. Um, and the focus was on how we could use the activities at the moon that are now kind of central to NASA's exploration plan to set the stage for going on to Mars. Okay. And so uh, do you guys have anything you would like to add to that? Yeah, I think um, the important thing here is that, you know, NASA is kind of now returned to the idea of going back to the moon and we've got architectures, we've got spacecraft, you know, uh, NASA's working on uh, SLS, the Space Launch System. Um, they're working on the Orion capsule. These are all um, pieces of hardware that um, that really enable going back to the moon um, in, the, in the nearer term and later on further out to Mars. Um, and NASA is also talking about building a gateway, um, an orbit around the moon, that all of these things kind of play out for an exploration activities at the moon um, and doing stuff on the moon. And so given that architecture and assuming that those hardware pieces of hardware will be available, um, we, you know, the question was really what is it that we can really do at the moon that will enable us to um, more easily and cost effectively go out to Mars? with humans and uh and so really that was that was the the focus as to uh, what we can do on the moon and make sure that whatever it is that we do on the moon kind of targets us forward on a forward trajectory with humans to mars in the 2030s so it sounds like you guys are trying to uh coordinate your efforts right i mean yeah i don't know I we have we we had uh, we had some members from NASA talking to us about the gateway uh, that you just mentioned, uh, Steve. And I, I, I guess I was a little surprised uh, at the reaction to it. That I thought the the gateway was a pretty good idea, it made sense to me. I didn't see what the big deal was. Sure, if you want to, maybe it isn't going straight to the moon. But then there were these people out there just vehemently against it. They just thought, what a dumb idea. Let's just go to the moon. And build mm -hmm. stuff there, and then and then build our bases there to go to other places. So, uh, what to what extent is the gateway involved in your plans for going to the moon, or did you guys not talk about that? You just talked about lunar efforts going forward. Uh, uh, what I would we, say is, we kind of assumed yeah. that the gateway was going to be there because it's in NASA's plans. We didn't um, we didn't pick it apart and say whether that was the best alternative for getting for doing things at the moon right now we're basically following um nasa's line that um they're not ready to go to the surface of the moon with humans um so in the meantime um they need uh they need uh somewhere near the moon that they can do operations from yeah and i think well, that i think that's yeah. right as for operation, yeah, do you mean but, like a fuel depot or do you mean things like assembly there for then taking things onto the moon or what, what do you think they really mean and how can think that be? About, think about one aspect of this and that is sustainability. 
Um, this was a part of our earlier workshops on you know, going to Mars. And we had similar complaints from some of the outputs of those workshops from people who just want to go straight to Mars, Mars direct. You know, um, there's a lot of, of people that are impatient and we get that. But the other side of it is we don't want to do another Apollo program where we just go put some boot prints on the moon and come back and say, it's done, it's over. Um, we want to go and keep going. And so part of what we address and where the gateway fits in is you can use that infrastructure that you build up to make a more sustainable long-term commitment. And things like landers can be reusable rather than throw away. Um, you mentioned fuel depots. If we are able to use the resources on the moon, and I'm sure Clive is going to want to jump in about some of the exciting discoveries yeah. that have yeah. happened recently yeah, about yeah. the potential for resources out there. But that makes a perfect place then to aggregate and mm -hmm. refuel and refurbish. And, and it's a wonderful jumping off point for going further out into space. Um, I was just reading a paper the day before yesterday on the airplane flight to where I am now in Seattle about a study that was done not by anyone in our group, but someone uh, has been looking at using the uh, L2 halo orbit, which is where the gateway would be, as a departure point doing an overt maneuver. Uh, and it's a very, very effective way to go on out and go to asteroids, go to Mars. So I really don't, I, I strongly disagree with the people who say go direct. I think it's, uh, I think it's a faulty logic that they're employing. Well, again, if you look at Gateway, uh, the architecture for the moon with an orbital platform is probably w what would be the most uh, logical to get to do on Mars. And we're starting to use the moon as a proving ground, and the moon is close, and uh, we have been there before, um, but uh, we don't want to repeat Apollo because Apollo showed us how not to do human spaceflight in a sustainable way because it got cancelled. Yeah, next year is the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 and the 47th anniversary of Apollo 17, the last uh, human mm. mission to the moon. So how do we create something sustainable? Um, so, you know, the gateway is certainly not perfect. Uh, it, it has evolved immensely. But this, this meeting in August was not a uh, meeting about the gateway. The gateway was one of the four lunar scenarios that we actually looked at mm. in terms of could this be used to feed forward to Mars and enable Mars? Mm -hmm. So there was the gateway, uh, there was the extended sortie missions or extended Apollo type missions. There was what was termed the uh, um, global exploration roadmap, which is um, the uh, International Space Exploration Coordination Group of 14 space agencies where they have mobile rovers and they have extended, extended surface stays and basically a mobile habitat. And then the last one was a, uh, a lunar field station, similar to something that would, uh, uh, that would be expected to be on Mars with a little bit more permanence. And then looking at those different scenarios um, with the long poles that we were given, the technology gaps or the development that was needed, um, how, how would each of these enable um, the, the Mars, Mars forward aspect of it. So, I mean, we do have this, this rather pleasant little uh, lab in, the, in our back garden that we can use to test things, to mm -hmm. test systems, test technologies, and hopefully reduce a lot of risk in terms of sending humans out to Mars. So was part of the result of, the, of this meeting to rank those four scenarios you just mentioned or just analyze them and, and kind of move forward to figure out how it, it's, suitable? It was not a, it was not a it, these were the scenarios. We were, not, we were not allowed to modify them. I see. This is the architectures as we know them. So we assume that those are the ones that are going to be on the books um, and you move forward. This was not, as I say, this was not developing lunar architecture. It was mm -hmm. using what we know may be in the mix to use that then to move forward and as well as incorporate new uh, new scientific data as it just uh, as it just come in with regards to resources so so yeah, and i think five if i could uh, i just and also in response to that question so exactly as clive said we didn't modify those those were given but we did go in then at two subgroups we had a, a what we call the transportation subgroup and a surface system subgroup and those two subgroups then, with the set of long poles that we had to address for going forward to Mars, looked at uh, each of those four scenarios 
and rank the ability of those scenarios to address those long poles. So that was the real work that we did. I'd say that was the meat of the work um, that we did. And that's going to come out in our report that we're hoping to publish soon after the first of next year. I see. Yep. Well, can you give us a little preview then? I mean, what was the, so would you say long pole? What was the long? I couldn't quite hear that. Uh, it's, it's, it's a Martian, isn't yeah, long pole. Yeah, long poles are just the NASA vernacular for things that have to, risks that have to get burned down before we're ready to go to Mars. So um, an example is uh, propulsion. I'm a propulsion guy. Um, what are we going to need for a MAV? You know, what are we going to use to get off the surface and come home from Mars? And how could we work on that at the moon was one of our questions in our transportation group. Uh, so things like cryogenic uh, engines in the thrust class, uh, that you know, uh, it's a 20k thrust class engine that's throttleable and cryogenic propellant. Um, and obviously, that's something that you know, we can test out um, with lunar landers. Yeah, one of the one of the big things I think I got out of this was the synergies between the two destinations that allows technology to be developed that is basically destination agnostic. Because we've been following, well, we go to the moon, we go to Mars, we go to asteroids, and in reality, we still can't send humans to the space station. So we need to do things a little different here. So <laughs> I'm by, so glad you said that. <laughs> yeah, working, working on the synergies, working on the synergies then between destinations allows progress to be made. And, and the thing that really, I came out of that meeting basically shocked at how many synergies there are and how once we got over the turf war and, you know, forget the turf war, it's not the moon or Mars, it's the moon and Mars, let's move forward. Um, things started to happen and in a very positive way. And I think when you get two communities talking to each other and not at each other, you can actually achieve something. And I think that's what came out of this meeting. So now you feel like Clive, that there is a, there's a willingness for the lunar guys, such as yourselves, to be dealing with the Mars, the Mars guys like Joe and 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 Steve, right? You feel like there's a there's a a communication that wasn't there before. There's, there's, there's never not been a communication between the groups that I've been leading in the Martian community. I mean, if you look at the roadmap we put together for the lunar exploration analysis group, one third of that roadmap is using the moon to feed forward to Mars and other destinations. Yeah. We mm -hmm. realize that the moon is, a, is, is a, an asset, an enabling asset to go further. Um, and, and what people are worried about, and I've heard the rhetoric for many, many years, if we go to the moon, we'll just get stuck there. Well, no, we won't, because built into the roadmap are strategies to leverage whatever NASA or space agencies put together to the commercial sector. So you don't abandon your assets, but you free up the agencies to do other things. And that's what we started to talk about at this meeting was how, how do we actually start to do that? What are the synergies? Um, and one of the things came, uh, resources became a big one. You've got water ice on Mars. I mean, they find it every time they land there or send an orbiter. We now know that there's a quite abundant water ice on the moon. So uh, we have a, a, a common resource Agreed. that could be used to develop um, life support <laughs> systems. Uh, it could be used to develop radiation protection. It could be used to create liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen for rocket engines. Um, and that can be done on both planets. But are the technologies that are needed, given the environmental differences, the same? That's, that's a big question that needs to be looked at and uh, brought down. Yeah. And so in the other part of that, of course, is that, you know, just following through with the liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen thing, you know, basically cracking water to make um, those two essential components for a hydrogen oxygen um, propulsion system. Um, you know, the, 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 the direction we go, um, do we follow a liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen propulsion system, which would mean that we're going up and down to the surface of the moon using that rather than um, hypergolds or some of the, the, the perhaps cheaper but, um, but less feed forward uh, capabilities. Um, going to Mars, um, we've talked about using um, liquid oxygen, um, liquid methane 
uh, propulsion systems because there's abundant um, carbon dioxide at Mars. So why would we want to set up two different type of propulsion systems if we're going to have an effective, sustainable program that advances out into the solar system? These were the sorts of discussions that we had. The other area besides resources that we talked a lot about was this inevitable discussion about um, can we send humans effectively out to Mars and, and get them there sane, alive, uh, coherent and able to actually do things and then bring them back? And what kind of things do we have to do with humans in the near term um, to be able to retire the risks and bring them back uh, from Mars? Are there things that we can do at the gateway? Are there things that we can do on the surface of the moon to prepare people or, um, or at least high grade the sorts of preparation that we do for the humans? I want to drill in on that well, since you brought it up right now before I forget, because this is something I am extremely concerned about. And you brought up the health effects of going not just to the moon, but to Mars. Mm -hmm. We did a series of hangouts last year here on Future in Space with Arnold Nikogosian from George Mason University. He wrote a textbook mm -hmm. on space physiology. We, I learned so much from him about the health and physiological aspects of going into space and, and, I left those that hangout the series feeling really pessimistic about the human <laughs> human's ability to survive in space. Yep. I mean, I don't know that it, it's certainly not healthy for us, but can we even do it is an open question. So, what I want to ask you guys is, it, what it was the consensus in that meeting and amongst your or even just your own opinions about that topic? Can human beings safely exist in space? I mean, is Mars going to kill us? Is the moon going to kill us? Can we even do this long term? <laughs> well, that's, that's a big part of what we need to go out there and start to learn. We have right now a database of exactly 12 humans, all men. <laughs> uh, and the uh, extent of the time beyond the Van Allen belts is uh, <laughs> something less than two weeks, right? <laughs> so that's, that's our entire database that we're, that we're looking at. Um, we have a lot of data from ISS. Uh, Scott Kelly, you know, and several Russian cosmonauts have been up there for extremely long durations, longer than a transit to Mars. Uh, but that's not the same as deep space. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. And then there's also the, the psychological aspects. And that was another part that got discussed in our groups uh, quite a bit is the isolation, the long, long duration, um, the shrinking Earth. The fact that you're no longer looking out your window like the folks on the space station do and seeing this big blue planet right there, almost where you can touch it and, and see the clouds and see the mm -hmm. activity on the surface. You know, it, it's going to be a very different kind of thing for those folks. Um, so I'll let Steve and Clive comment more. But that that's definitely something I would say my personal opinion is we can do it. It's not going to kill us. Um, but you know, it's going to be the kind of thing where you have to have a committed group of people who are willing to go out there. It's a very calculated risk that they're taking, mm -hmm. and it's going to be a career trip. You're going to go. You're going to you're going to get your dose, uh, to, basically, as your career dose on one trip to Mars, and then you'll come home and and tell your grandkids about your great adventure. Yeah. Do you guys want to comment, Steve or Clive, or even Alberto? You got an opinion on this? I got an opinion on it, but uh, that's probably not a surprise. Um, the, the, uh, the, if you if you look at station, station is great for telling us about the transit phase. The problem we've got with space station is that it's still within the Earth's magnetic field. So as, as yeah. Joe alluded to, it's not it's not deep space. The moon is deep space, but it's also at one six g. Now, we know a lot about what human physiology does under 1G. We know a, a little bit about what it does at micro G, but we really know nothing about 1.6G, long duration at 1.6G. So if you have, um, as you're developing a spacecraft to go to Mars, maybe 1.6G is, is all you need to actually bring more stabilization to the human physiology than having them floating around in micro G all the way out there rather than the full 1G. We know nothing about that. Uh, testing radiation technologies. Water is a great shielder for ionizing radiation. Um, you can put that sheet around the spacecraft from lunar ISRU because the reduced gravity well. 
um, and it's something that can be uh, can be used to sort of fit the spacecraft as it's on its way out. But the moon becomes our testing place in terms of the gravity gravitational field as well as the radiation environment. Now you can do that on Gateway, but right now Gateway is only supposed to be occupied for about 30 days each year. Right. Uh, it's not much of a database if you, if you do that. So you need something a little bit more permanent on the surface to actually buy down that risk sooner rather than later, rather than just try and send out humans to Mars straight away. I mean, that's why these Mars Direct folks, I'm sorry, but um, if you want to go, then sure, go. But we, we don't need to do a return journey right now um, mm -hmm. because you're going to be dead. So, so I think we need to buy that risk down and uh, we have our, have our proving ground pretty close by. Um, so uh, this, is, this is why I, I truly believe that uh, the moon is the gateway to Mars. Okay, mm -hmm. so it sounds like, okay, so Clive, you're also not a fan of just going straight there. Joe already said he's not. Uh, what about you, Steve? Um, I think there's a lot of things that we need to, a lot of risks we need to retire before we send humans out to Mars. And, and you know, the, the, the biggest ones, of course, are, are the damage to the human physiology um, as the radiation environment's very, very key. Um, we're, we're starting to learn about things like genetic screening uh, mm -hmm. to to. to pre-select people who are not in any way disposed towards um, the sorts of radiation damage effects that you would get on the trip. Um, and various other factors too that, um, that certain people um, are more inclined to um, uh, get space sick, um, even in station. Um, but do we know exactly what the genetic drivers for that are? Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a whole slew of things. There are problems with the eyes, um, uh, cosmic radiation is is a big issue um, <laughs> coming out. Um, but if you talk to, the, to to many of the astronauts, um, they'll basically say, "Hey, yeah, we can do it." Um, there's a real gun. Oh, yeah, you don't ask thing. astronauts. They they're gonna. Yeah, you don't. They're not yeah. the people to ask. No, no, no. They're but yeah. one way, two way, anyway. Right? Yeah, yeah exactly. That's exactly well, right. And there are a lot of people out there who would go to Mars, hell and high water. Um, exactly. <laughs> the, the, the thing the thing that would freak me out was arriving there and 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 you know you having lost all your cognitive capabilities because you weren't pre-screened and you weren't uh ready the spacecraft wasn't optimized to protect you oh um, my god you could, could, have, could you imagine it, yeah there is a lot so, of stuff we have and i want to jump in if, if i can let me jump in on steve's comment there because that reminded me steve of one of the other aspects we had some human um human physiology people in our groups uh, from the HRT program at NASA. And one of the other things they pointed out was, and we can, we can begin to pathfind this also with, with uh, the lunar programs and Gateway, um, is the level of care that you have to be able to provide for a journey like that, that is beyond what we have today on mm -hmm. things like station where you know, the, the latency problems aren't so severe that if you had a problem on, on station, somebody couldn't kind of coach one of the other crew from the ground about what to do in a bad emergency. But if you have something like that come up or somebody starts to go a little crazy on the way out to Mars, you have to have basically um, the onboard capability, whether that's in a smart AI assistant or with a crew member who's, you know, the, the doc, uh, to be able to deal with a lot of contingencies that could happen to people. Yeah. 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 And, 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 you know, the thing is that it's not just the humans that we don't understand um, completely the impact of being in open space. You know, there's foodstuffs. How, um, how, 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 how long are they going to last? A, a round trip to Mars is, is a couple of years using current, um, current uh, spacecraft. So, so it gets tricky. And, and drugs. Yeah. Um, what happens if your drugs lose all their vitality within the first six months? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, no, but I get, I get, yeah, I was going to add one thing, Tony. Sorry. Yeah, I, go I ahead, get, Albert. Uh, no, my, the interesting thing for me would be uh, not to do like we did with the moon, where it's a one shot, 12 people, and then 50 years later, we are trying to figure out how to get back there, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. We want to make it sustainable. We want to yeah. make it. So I think that's why the moon is very appealing, right? Yeah. Uh, because then, you know, and so I understand, you know, people want to go there directly and, Maybe if you can make your trip in three months with new technology, maybe in propulsion, I don't know, right? But the issue is you're still going to bypass the moon and you're really not going to understand very much, I think. Right. right. 
Oh, you're not going to understand very much, but you miss an opportunity because something we haven't talked about is is developing the space economy through the moon. We, yeah, we see, we're seeing a lot of a lot of new business opportunities for for lunar um, lunar related activities. Uh, we're seeing new companies blossom uh, because of the current uh, push to involve uh, um, the private sector. Um, if you then bring in the fact that the the resources on the moon. To enable the, the mining sector to start to take notice, or maybe some companies have different ideas of how to extract some of these resources. You know, you, you've got a you've got a, a, a potential there to to really jumpstart uh, a, a new new sector of the economy. Um, and working at a university, I know I, I'd love for my, my students to tell me when I say, "What are you going to do after Notre Dame?" They turn around and say, "Well, we're going to go work on the moon." Because I really think we, we have an opportunity to make that a reality now um, mm -hmm. because of this sustainability aspect. It comes through using NASA's budget as an investment to stimulate that economy. And I think that that is a really important thing that you cannot do with Mars right now. If you branch out the economy to the moon and build that to a robust, self-sustaining economy, then maybe Mars comes into the mix. But we have an opportunity here not to say, oh, it's a taxpayer uh, funded uh, mission directive. No, no, this is an investment in the country's future. It's an investment in the country's youth and it's investment in the country's capability. Um, and, and that all happens because of them using the moon to go to other places and developing the, the resources there to take full advantage of that capability. All right. And by the same token, I would add that I don't think anybody thinks that Mars is not the next objective either, right? So right. Mars eventually will take place. It's just yeah. a matter of when. Yeah, well, it's, we would like it to take place sooner rather than later. Of course. And, and you've got to retire these risks at the moon. Otherwise, you're going to be in the business of killing people. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's really... Well, and the other and, thing and is... it's really not... Oh, let's go ahead, Steve. I was just going to say, the, the, the Clive raises a really excellent point, and that is that um, the resources on the moon are, are the way of drawing in the commercial sector into... Um, actual commercial activity in space but the, the key the key thing there is those resources allow us to cost um, to to reduce significant cost in going out further into the solar system potentially um, potentially potentially yeah well this we, goes we, oh i'm sorry right and and we learn so much while we're doing i was going to just bring yeah. up the point i, I yeah. completely agree with everything clive said and steve's comment um and in terms of delaying going to mars and one of the things I'm one of the folks, as I said, from Explore Mars, and our stated objective is humans to Mars in the 2030s. Um, I think that's written into our uh, manifesto that's on our website. Um, but so I'm not I'm not about saying let's go to the moon and and we'll get to Mars someday. I'm about saying let's go to the moon. Let's start to do these things that Clive mentioned. Let's just invigorate the you know potential economy. Um, and, and probably, I've looked at a lot of different architectures, probably the first things we do with going to Mars will benefit from some of the things that we've done at the moon, but won't necessarily wait until we have all those resources available, like the, the water ice and right. things like that. We'll go ahead and go in parallel, but we will then be able to on-ramp all of that as it comes online. And it's just going to make, you know, this whole idea, again, about sustainability it's going to make it get easier and easier for us to do these trips back and forth. You know, the idea again, that you can leave these L2 halo orbits and drop into earth's gravity well and get yourself going to, you know, make the most effective transfer out to Mars. It's a great concept and it takes advantage of all those things that Clive and Steve have described as well as, you know, the natural locations in, in the earth moon gravity well uh, for doing things at the right places. Yeah, um, it's yep. completely different than these other ideas that people are putting out there about the, you know, we can just launch and go direct. Um, doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't really pencil when you start looking at that. Yeah, yeah and, and and really, it's kind of an interesting um, interesting thought because you know we've talked about um, about going out to Mars and we've talked about going back to the moon for um, ever since we left the moon the last time. <laughs> we've been talking about going to these other destinations and, and people could ask, well, what's different now? Um, one of the key elements that's different is that um, we now have a, uh, a nascent um, commercial activities associated with 
you know, rocket launchers, um, potentially landing uh, capabilities on the moon. We're looking at uh, commercial, you know, entities actually thinking about capitalizing on uh, resources and space. Yeah. And that's the big difference. Now, the other, the other side of the commercial side, of course, is, you know, we got people who'll pay to go to station, people who will pay to do a loop around the moon, people who would pay to, um, to, to go out to Mars. But this is, um, this is only ultimately sustainable if you've got enough of a business case that the commercial guys can make yeah. to be able to achieve it. So, um, so that's what's different about what we've got now is that there are commercial entities playing um, and that uh, those commercial entities can, as Clive said, take over um, once we've established uh, infrastructure in places like the surface of the moon and allow NASA and the other space agencies to keep moving out into the solar system. Um, and that, I think, is really key to where we are now and why now is very much different than it was a decade ago or two decades ago. I heard somebody say, I, I, I read an article, I think it was by Eric Berger from Ars Technica, who made the point that we are reaching the uh, end of the beginning uh, in of our of our efforts in space travel, meaning that these government-sponsored, huge, taxpayer-funded missions are giving way now to these more privately commercial-oriented uh options and with the big companies that are out there now the spacex's and, and blue origin and all of that uh and you know virgin galactic um these guys are opening up a new era and making the business case or at least trying to of getting out into space uh and and getting this done so i think you guys are right on about that and i i want to go back to so we've talked a little bit about uh you know the economics of getting to the moon, why that's important. We've also talked about how the moon will help us going to the moon first will help us uh, study the health effects. We can build environments and study what happens outside the earth's magnetic field. What else can we get out of the moon first by, before we go to Mars, what other things can the moon do for us? Developing operations. Um, that's uh, yeah. operations off planet on the surface becomes very important um, and you can build in latency on the moon that is not life-threatening um, you can break it if needed but what it does is it allows you to test that in a in a very um a more mars-like environment that would so would be say antarctica um, oh that's a good point what do you mean by by legacy that's or latency that's not well, life threatening latency is that it's you can't contact earth and get a ah. response and you know immediately sure sure okay and you can build that into your comms when you're developing a a surface operation scenario um so again you're reducing risk of when you've got humans that arrive after what six months in space uh, they're probably not going to be firing on all cylinders so you need to recuperate them how do you recuperate so you need to uh you get them get them out there and you give them scenarios to deal with. Um, and you can see, you can develop your surface operations and your contingency plans uh, for something where it's really then critical um, that you cannot immediately get a response from mission control or the back room or, mm -hmm. or this sort of thing. So surface operations becomes important as well as surface infrastructure technologies. Um, mm -hmm. if, you, if you build rovers and... Uh, Mavs or Moon or Mars ascent vehicles. Um, you can test those on the Moon. All right, there's atmosphere on Mars, but we know what that atmosphere is. We've landed there before. We've never taken off from Mars, so um, we can. <laughs> Good we can point. To, so you know, so yeah. we, we, if you're going to send humans to the surface, you need to get them back. That's, that's uh, sort of important. That. Yeah. yeah. Um, so right. you, and you've then got your your. I was going to say, Clive. Go ahead. Even even the descent part is, is important because um, you know it's not the same as entry descent and landing at Mars, but that terminal descent. One of the main scenarios now we're looking at for Mars is going to the same site over and over to build up capability. Yep. yep. And what that requires you to do is do very very tight precision landing. And I mentioned the cryo propellant and the and the engine technology that we could develop and test at the moon. You can also test that that whole um, concept for precision landing um, in a lunar scenario 
and work that out before you, you know, or as Clive said, I, I look at it like it's a much higher fidelity sim than you can do on yep. Earth. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And there are lots of things that we can practice on the moon. You know, living on another planetary surface that doesn't have an atmosphere where you've got to be in and out of suits, you've got to be in and out of rovers, out of habitats, things like that. There are so many trip points that could be disastrous that you need to understand. Um, you know, it's, it's different from when you're just on the surface for three days versus you're going to be on the surface for yeah. three weeks or three months. Um, or the, you know, so there are many ways in which you've got to um, uh, retire the, the challenge, the risks that you have associated with ingress and egress from vehicles, um, how you move around on the surface. Um, there are things like um, how do you establish, uh, you know, gardens? How mm -hmm. do you do? Okay, so the soil on Mars is different from the soil on, on the moon. Um, but, you know, you still have to figure out how you're going to develop food sources and things like that. Yeah, we saw that on the Martian. It's easy. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, poop. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's one word for it. Yeah, <laughs> I want to get to I want to start getting to some of the questions on the chat. But um, uh, before I start, I want I just want to get back to this roadmap for a minute. I think a lot of our skepticism, at least I know where mine comes from. I hear we've been talking about Mars since the Bush administration. And before that, uh, NASA has a roadmap now. It includes the gateway. You guys are meeting and you're all collaborating and you're saying, yes, OK, uh, we can we can work together to get from the moon and Mars together. Um, do these roadmaps stay together i mean what what confidence should we have in this roadmap that that suddenly the winds of change politically and financial whatever it is um are going to just sweep it all away i mean i can easily remember when the when the iss was the freedom space station and it went through so many uh iterations that mm -hmm. you know when it finally got built it was decades later and mm -hmm. i don't know i just i'm i'm skeptical of these roadmaps that NASA puts out. And I would like to get your input on whether you guys have, or have confidence in this or not. Well, with roadmaps, we've got to remember their plans and where roadmaps let us down for the most part is the, they, they have their, uh, they have their deadlines, their milestones at times. We will be on the moon by 2022 and the budget tanks and you miss your deadline, you're a failure. Right. So you, you need to start setting up your roadmaps to have milestones that are capability-driven. So you have... And not, as opposed to being time-driven? I'm sorry. Exactly. Oh, okay. All right, then. Exactly. You, we need these capabilities that will enable us to do what we want to do. I see. So you have, a, you have a lean budget year, then you don't make as much progress, but you still show you're making progress to your stakeholders in getting that um getting that capability right now sls well we're going to have sls built by such and such a date well hopefully but it's, i know it's slipped it keeps slipping yeah so you set yourself up for failure depending upon a continuum resolution or a budget that you cannot control or a cost plus contract that you know oh, need... there you go yeah yeah yep. uh, it's uh mm -hmm. so so you 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 can't uh you, so don't set yourself up for failure with a roadmap like that. So it's capability driven. The goal is still there and it may take decades. But okay. the thing is, you continually show you are making progress rather than tell the general public we didn't meet our deadline because that is now interpreted as failure. OK, so Clive, could an example of that be we need the capability to protect human beings from radiation for two months? That might be a capability. And that's yep. written into the roadmap. When right. we've achieved that, we can check it off. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's what, really that what the long it. poles are that we've identified. Yeah. When you the way you just yeah. the way you just described that, that's essentially what each of those long poles is. Yep, yeah. and that's what NASA is doing with this roadmap. They're capable. Uh, it's capability driven. I, I'm not going to answer that. that. I think there's, <laughs> you know, there's always a, there's always a, a challenge trying when you're dealing with with people who have you know. <laughs> goals in mind during a certain time frame like you know a presidential administration they want to they want to see things happen while they're still around i'm just gonna say it N That's nasa needs different. to get out they need to stop being a political plaything I'm, I'm sick of it they need people it needs to be left alone 
uh, and and just let. But I don't know how. It's always from the very beginning so, been a been a been a yeah, football. Tony, I think. Yeah, I think the the way we've been trying to say that the last several years is constancy of purpose. You know, oh, yeah, we yeah. Need to have yep. that goal in mind and keep working toward it, and not have this you know whip sawing back and forth. That's why you have a destination agnostic uh, technology development plan that allows you to go to different destinations um, yeah. and you, you show progress to expand in humanity off planet. Yeah. And the community based um, kind of plans that we lay out, you know, our roadmaps, the community based ones are designed specifically to be flexible and to be revisited frequently. And that way, you know, if there's any, some new technology comes on that can accelerate certain parts you can you can tweak the roadmap to actually accommodate that. Yep. And if you don't have the funding, then your roadmap still kind of holds because it's not based on specific deadlines, but yep. based on a structured approach to achievement that allows you to make progressive steps in the direction you need to go. And um, the reason reason why those time deadlines are there is because of Kennedy. I know, yeah. I know. We can't yeah. get away from yeah. that, can we? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, you challenged that, now. So that's a really it. good point because you you said it earlier, Clive. It's, it's Apollo showed us the way not to do it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly right. We're we're forever caught in this. I'm gonna say this and be great, and we're going to do it, and I'll get the credit, and then of course it all falls apart. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, well, I, 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 it's really getting frustrating. You it really sounded is. very jaded there, Tony. I'm sorry. But well, it's only because it's not, I've just watched this. I've been talking about, we had a footsteps to Mars hangout. We had to cancel it because there were no footsteps to Mars happening. And so it was like, we were just talking about, you know, Mars as if it were this wispy thing. And, and now, no, but I am, I am very gratified by what you guys have told me here today. It sounds like the lunar guys. Cheer you up. There, there was, there was just a, a seismometer placed on the surface of Mars. Come on. That's a footstep. I know. Insight was very good. It was very good. Come on, Tony. Yeah, we have to make sure that everything, you know, that if if we're doing stuff on the moon that we can clearly clearly demonstrate is is moving us in the direction of Mars, then I think that it's a major a major progress because, you know, the the thing that most concern us is is kind of the the blind alley stuff where for whatever reason you basically go and you do a destination specific technology development that doesn't enable you to move beyond. That's kind of the way you get really, really stuck. And, yeah, and, and, and how dangerous is, I mean, how many of those have you guys, do we have? Are there, are there some of those that we've got to overcome? Things that absolutely uh, stop the, oh, stop the train. Yeah, another, another recommendation that came out of the workshop was that we need sort of something within the agency that looks at this as a, an overarching um, goal from you know I, I've seen it recently they're branding it as moon to Mars yeah and that's really what we're saying is we need something where the person in charge of that is looking or the group in charge of that is looking at this whole thing as an arc and not as an individual goal that's gonna you know we will have boots on the moon by 2024 and if you do that mm-hmm. they're gonna go to collapse down to the minimum technology that you need to accomplish that first step yeah. and you're not going to do things like develop those cryogenic engine technologies that we actually need for the MAV whereas if you're looking at it as the total arc you'll say yeah let's let's go ahead and take a little bit longer on the front end build those cryo engines for our landers test those at the moon and then we check that box off that long pole that we talked about yeah. is checked off on the moon for the MAV and we yeah. can now you know we've got what we need to fly the MAV and get up off the surface of Mars. And build in sustainability that way as well. So you don't just do flags and footprints and claim victory and forget it. So. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, um, I, uh, there's a question. I think it was Jake from Upcycle Electronics. It scrolled past now and I can't find it, but I want to know this too. You, you talked about capability-driven roadmaps, which I think are absolutely awesome, and I'm happy to hear about this. Uh, th- I don't think Clive wants to commit that this is what we actually have, but at least I like the idea of it. Oh, the idea is we have it. I don't know whether NASA has it. Okay. <laughs> so, so one of the capabilities has to be getting off of Earth, uh, and yep. that I think is depending, how heavily is that capability depending on SLS? 
Uh, but that's one way. technology, by the way. And yeah. it doesn't sound like, in a way, we kind of, when you say, I want this capability, sometimes doesn't that also mean that you're wedding yourself to one kind of technology only, in this case, SLS, or a launch system? Yeah, I think, I think what you'll see, though, if you dig in a little deeper, Tony, is um, the plan right now for Gateway as the first step, has a lot of commercial launch in there. Um, there's the, the element that's going to be the first one that gets launched in 2022 is going on a commercial launch vehicle. Okay. The power propulsion element. Yeah. Um, beyond that, there's logistics flights about every other year that are also commercial launches. Mm -hmm. What SLS does is it gives us the lift capability to get the crew um, and, you know, hopefully a little bit of co-manifested payload, uh, all done in one big launch. And, and yeah. I will say, I'll add my piece is it's going to be really important when we need to launch the really big blocks that we're going to need to take out to Mars to prepare the way for the crew. So it's, again, it's one of those things where you're looking at the big arc. It may not be the only, uh, you know, required thing we need to go do these things around the moon, but. Uh, and we're not looking at it that way. We're doing exactly what Clive said earlier. We're trying to blend the commercial people that are interested in going and doing this for other reasons, for business cases, and with what NASA wants to do. But I would say, coming back to something you said earlier, the business case isn't there for Mars. Um, NASA and the government will always need to be the one who funds those exploration. And my, my, you know, at the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning, the thing that you said, Eric Berger said, mm -hmm. I think that's true for like commercial Leo and for maybe even out to the moon. Um, and it's, and it's kind of like, you know, we went from flying the mail to airlines, but we still have the government doing Antarctica and, and Mars is going to be like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can see, yeah, I can see that that being a lot longer for that. But let me read um, John Suffolk's comment. He's uh, from the UK. For Mars, we need a huge multinational effort involving the U.S., Russia, Europe, and probably China. And of course, in his normal uh, in 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 the UK humor, he's saying, and of course, all of them are nice and friendly to each other right now. <laughs> what what about that? What about this roadmap, including other countries? Is there any talk of that? Oh, absolutely. Um, this is a has to be, uh, you know, a very broadly based thing. I think uh, NASA is, is has been talking very specifically about that um, human exploration has to be um, for to be sustainable. It has to be international. It has to involve the commercial sector. It has to be very broadly based. Um, no single nation can really afford to have a major human uh, space program on yeah. their own. Yeah, and Aram is coming. Oh, I'm sorry. Did anybody else want to comment? Oh, I'm just going to say that GER scenario that we looked at that, that uh, Eber Clive mentioned earlier is global. And the G stands for global. And oh. it has elements from Japan, from JAXA, elements, I believe, from definitely from ESA members, and um, I believe even from Russia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, Aram is commenting, why not visit and land on Phobos and Deimos before landing on Mars? Could be interesting. Any, any talk of the moons of Mars? Subject of, uh, subject of AM3 workshop. We looked at that. Uh, I would refer you to the Explore Mars website and look at the Affording Mars 3 workshop report. I think that's exploremars.org, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, You're right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, okay. So check that out. Good question. Um, uh, let's see. I'm trying to get to. Oh, no one's mentioned Elon Musk yet. Um, <laughs> I guess. I guess we should. Uh, what about that? Him, SpaceX, all that. Is he going to ruin it? Or is he going to do it? Or is he going to just make a mess? <laughs> what are you guys' opinions on Elon Musk and SpaceX going to Mars first? Going good to luck. Mars first. Good Ooh. luck. Yeah, good luck. Because he's going. That he's not going to the moon. He's going straight to Mars. So good, good for Elon. Go for it, man. Go for yep. it, mate. <laughs> okay. Go for it. It's definitely got a lot of public interest. Uh, you know, from, from our perspective, uh, the more folks talking about Mars, the better. Okay. Yep. I, Certainly, I he's going to Tesla past Mars. So yeah. anything's possible. Well, I mean, as I say, he may, may develop something that uh, we haven't thought of or other people haven't thought of. But I still say if you go direct to Mars right now, you're going to kill people. Yep. 
Okay, so upcycle electronics. Why build a base on the moon? Building an orbital station or gateway seems like a much easier engineering endeavor endeavor than a permanent base on a foreign world. I guess that's uh, NASA's couple. argument, isn't it? Well, the thing is that that if you don't actually put infrastructure on the surface of the moon, a lot of the operational uh, experiences and and capabilities that you need to retire, you know, risks you need to retire for humans working yeah. on another planetary surface. You don't get that unless you've got humans on the surface and on the surface for long enough to actually do serious test bed type activities. Um, you know, and and the the really really important other aspect, of course, is that if you are going to try and maintain a sustainable future exploration of space, then you are going to need to capitalize on the resources that are there. Yeah. And um, to be able to do that effectively, it's probably going to have to have humans in the loop. Yeah, can't <laughs> do that from a gateway. So yeah. you need to be on the and surface. I would just yeah. add to those are, those are great comments. I would add that, again, you know, in the report, which is advisory, obviously, that, you know, we, we don't have any... Uh, it's not binding. <laughs> Yeah, non-binding, but <laughs> but we are putting it out there for folks to look at. And one of the that was one of the things that the report will do is it'll characterize each of those sort of standalone scenarios that we mentioned at the beginning, um, as it applies. You know, you can see which ones had the most high applicability to reducing the long pole risk, and which ones uh, had less. And and so that's out there for folks who are considering these various options to take a look at. Okay. Ascanio Vitale uh, is commenting, we will very likely need to live in caves on Mars. Is there anything similar uh, on the moon? Yes. Uh, absolutely. Um, we know that there lava are um, lava tubes on both. Yep. yep. Yeah. I th what do you guys, I, I think that's probably a, one of the cheapest ways to shield us from radiation, isn't it? Or is yeah, it? Sure. Yeah. Just well, yeah. dig a hole. Yeah. Well, the hole's already dug. We just need to make sure we can if get the it. The hole's already dug. Oh, that's right. The, is that the lava tubes that James yeah, Dugan's talking about? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, James Dugan, you're right. There are lava tubes on on Mars, and they have found cave-ins that show an entrance. So, uh, good. Um, uh, let's see. Rami is also totally agreeing with the speaker on the phone, on ether, ether phone. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> ether phone. You're on ether phone now, Joe. Uh, <laughs> we need to have Joe on the phone more often. He's making a lot of sense today. Yeah. <laughs> they, it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's, he's, got, he's got the prettiest face of all. Yeah, there you go. And there's no ether, by the way, but that's all right. Abdul Qadar. <laughs> Abdul Qadar is asking, how come NASA yeah. is stuck with the overrated non-reusable SLS that costs five hundred million per launch, while SpaceX BFR will be far superior and totally reusable and cast way way less cost way, way less per launch? Well, there's a loaded question, everyone. Who wants well, to take that? Somebody pointed to the gorilla in the corner, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> you know why? It's because Congress made NASA do it. They, yeah. That's that's the short answer. <laughs> I'm going to let our rocket expert have first crack. All right, Joe, go for it, man. Oh. Ether phone. Well, okay. So so I'll just say that, um, you know, full disclosure, my company builds the engines for the core stage. Um, I'm a pretty big SLS fan. Um, it's certainly not, you know, there's no perfect uh, vehicle. Uh, but I do believe it, as I said earlier, it fills a lot of the needs we're going to have as we go further and further into space. Um, and I welcome the participation of you know, as many people, as I said earlier, as want to get involved. Um, but I just would say my caution on that comment that the, that the uh, uh, caller had was that, you know, one is well along into testing with a lot of metal being cut. The other is still behind. Uh, fairly far behind, and um, I'll I'll remain somewhat skeptical until I see some of those things actually flying. Okay, yeah, it kind of comes down a little bit to um, where do you where, where do you invest? Do you invest in a in larger payload capability to space, or do you invest in um, in in space assembly, presumably robotic assembly? So there there right. are pluses and minuses on both. Okay, I will. I, we're out of time, but I will go ahead and read Rami Imad's uh, question because he's asked it several times. Uh, what do you think about the lunar transit orbital, which is saving the Delta V needed to lift facilities up into orbit and only sending fuel and supplies? Do you know what that, what he's talking about there? 
and he said he fueled supplies from to the Earth. from the. I think Lunar Transit Orbital. I think he, I don't know if that's a company or okay. is that just a plan of getting things up to lunar or get it up in the, the moon first and then from there to Mars, lifting it. Any? Yeah, I think that might refer to what I was referring to earlier. You know, the the kind of idea that the gateways in these is near rectilinear halo orbits, which I always hesitate to say because I'm afraid I'm going to slip and say something bad. But um, <laughs> you the, did great. You did great. Yeah, yeah thank okay. you. <laughs> L2, L2 halo orbit families. They're kind of right on the edge of the lunar gravity well, um, and you know they're well out of Earth's uh, deep gravity well. They're they're great places to aggregate, and and I think you know one thing that's clear: if we're going to go to Mars, uh, we're going to end up assembling probably that Martian vehicle in orbit. We're not we're going to take it up there in pieces and put it together before we actually take off to the part. So that's probably a good place to do it. Okay, good. Uh, well, we're out of time, Alberto. You, I'm going to give you the last word on the subject. What do you think? When when are we going to Mars? Is, well, is all this going to happen? I want to go to the moon first. I mean, yeah. When, okay. No, let's go to the moon. I think let's go to the moon. I think uh, okay. My last word is this. I think uh, it's uh, it's critical that we follow a path that is sustainable, in my opinion, to go to the moon and uh, and eventually to Mars. I think others might go to Mars directly, but uh, maybe it's a one way t- ticket. Uh, we don't know yet. But uh, at the same time, it's uh, I want to push back a little bit about the Apollo. We we went to the moon, you know, probably for the wrong reasons, but. I would not I want to end with a positive note. I would not underestimate our ingenuity to, you know, to fix and right. uh, uh, lots yeah. of problems and to find new technologies that can actually get us to Mars faster than we can all think uh, uh, we can get there right now. So. Well mm-hmm. said. Okay, I will let yeah. I will let that be the final word. I am uh, very much. I, I I was a big fan of the Gateway, so I I, I think this is an outstanding plan. So I'm all I'm all for it. So I want to thank my guests today for joining our hangout. This well, we, we had Steve Mackwell from the USRA. And by the way, somebody asked what that stood for: University Space Research Association. Clive Neal, a lunar scientist from Notre Dame, as well as Joe Cassidy from the uh, Aerojet Rocket Dime, one of the coolest named companies ever, and uh, also my good friend Alberto Conti from North uh, from uh, uh, I knew I'd do that Ball, Ball Aerospace. Ball, Ball, Ball I'm Ball sorry, Aerospace. I'm sorry, I knew I'd do that. Ball I made Aerospace. That mistake uh, daily, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on behalf of everybody, and on with, on behalf of Harley Thronson, who's not here, I will show my my gravitational rubber ducky uh, to my gravitational wave rubber ducky to say good night. This will be our last uh, astro um this will be our last future in space hangout for the 2018 we will be back sometime in mid-january where we start back up again and i want to thank one more time the american astronautical society for their support for the past two years on these hangouts so thank you all very much thank you guys for watching and as always keep looking up